welcome everyone. Thank you, f uh, thank you to Kengo. Thank you to uh, uh, Tokyo Airflow Meetup uh, for hosting us. Uh, today I'm going to talk about uh, something that I was doing for the last uh, maybe year and a half: uh, production Docker image for Apache Airflow. Well, well, not necessarily production image, but Docker image in general. Uh, I was I was doing a lot of stuff around that uh, in Airflow, and actually the. The name of the talk should be production container image, not Docker image, which I will tell a little bit more about uh, later. But uh, first, few words uh, about me. So I'm, I'm the Apache Airflow PMC member and committer. Uh, uh, at work, I, I'm a principal software engineer uh, at Polydia, uh, the company that is called sponsoring the event, one of the sponsors. Uh, and I used to be a CTO in the company, and I decided to a few years ago, after six years of growing the company from like six to maybe 60 people, I, I decided uh, I love engineering more than, uh, than a managing company. And I decided to go back to principal uh, to engineering career, which I did, and I'm super happy about that. Uh, and also with Airflow Summit, I'm co-organizer. I, I was leading the content, although like the, 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 there was a whole team uh, selecting and choosing the content. Uh, I was just merely pushing in the right direction uh, or pulling uh, and helping to make sure that this is happening. And uh, Airflow Summit is so far, I think, very good uh, conference. Uh, okay, a uh, few things about the intro. Uh, First of all, for those who are watching that, I think it's it's fair to say what questions will be answered so that you decide if you want to watch the talk at all. Uh, so there will be some context about the what are container images and what uh, why, why they are so important um, and some status, uh, a little bit of history, how it looked like so far for Airflow, uh, what it's going to be right now. We, we have gone through like a lot of changes and uh, the, the situation with Docker image and Helm chart will look quite differently in the future for Airflow. Uh, and it starts now. Uh, some internals, what is in the image, how we test the image. Um, a little bit of uh, uh, guidelines of how you can use the image in your own uh, deployments. Uh, so how to extend and how to customize. And these are two different things. Uh, I'm not sure if that those are the right names, but I named them, them like that. Uh, how you can uh, really uh, use the image in production, how you deploy it, and what's next. So this is something that uh, that is, is really important to know, like what's next. Uh, this, these, are, these are plans that we have. Uh, and also for those who are watching that and decide if they want to watch it, uh, I will tell what the, talk, what the talk is not about. So it's not a basic knowledge about, uh, about containers and images. Uh, this is something that you can read in, in, in many places. This is one on, one example. Uh, no details about the CI container image for, that, for Airflow. So we have two containers, production and CI. And we, I'm not talking about CI just a little bit. Uh, it's more about the production image. The CI is, is a topic for another uh, separate talk, I think, at some point of time. Uh, or details how the Kubernetes Airflow integrates with the image. And for that, I'd like absolutely recommend the talk from uh, from Michael Hewitt, Airflow on Kubernetes, uh, which was at the very beginning, like second uh, second or third date of, of Airflow Summit. And I totally recommend that if you want to learn about Kubernetes, how Kubernetes work with Airflow. That's, uh, that's a fantastic talk. Um, and uh, some details. Uh, uh, also, we will not have any details about deploying Airflow. I'll just briefly tell how to deploy Airflow, how it, where you can deploy it, but how exactly, I will not go uh, in details. Uh, the talk is for people who are who want to deploy Airflow using container images. So this is the first uh, set of people who would like to use it. Or if you want to contribute to Airflow, uh, which I always recommend to, and I always uh, ask people to do uh, in the DevOps area, this is uh, something that not many people like to do. I, I love DevOps area, and I love to contribute both for programming and DevOps part. So if you want to contribute to Airflow in DevOps area, the, the, around the image is the right thing to do. Uh, or if you want to learn some best practices, how, how to build uh, Airflow containers and how to use them. Uh, or if you just are a curious person that wants to learn, uh, I also uh, heartily recommend you to watch this talk. This is the, it contains a few interesting things. 
So context, what is a container? Uh, container is a, uh, that's interesting thing. It's the standard unit of software. Uh, and I think the standard part is really important. So there is like this OCI, Open Containers Initiative. Uh, uh, you see the, uh, the logo here. Uh, the OCI uh, Container Initiative was created by Docker and a few other companies. Um, and it defines the standards on how you package code and its dependencies. So the, the container is nothing more than the code and its dependencies, and it's an, it's an execution unit. So you just ask the container to run. This is basically what you, what you do. And it's, it's super lightweight. So we used to have virtual machines in the past. And virtual machines are pretty much heavyweight because they contain both the operating system and the, and the software that they run on. And it's fairly difficult to manage, evolve, upgrade, etc., and run. And they are heavyweight because they, they take a lot of memory and, uh, and, and disk. And, and they are just, just, just clunky. Uh, and containers, after, after the virtual machines, they came containers. And containers are much easier because they're just binary packages of software. And the kernel is uh, taken from the host system that they're running on. So like far less memory usage, far, far less overhead, far, far less disk overhead. Uh, and they just execute the software in isolated environment. So this is, this is really, uh, uh, this is really where containers, what containers are. Uh, and I think the, the people, and I often do the same mistake. So there is a mistake between, or the difference between containers and container images. So container is the, 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 the execution unit that is running. So the software that is running, this is a container running container and container image is like a snapshot uh, of a disk for the container to run. So like snapshot of the, of the, of the file system. And so from the container image, you can start a container, but container image is just a, a, a binary package containing the file system. That's pretty much it. And container is just a running execution. It's running program uh, started from the container image. Uh, something that I wanted really to say is like container is not a Docker. So Docker, uh, Docker introduced containers to the world of development and uh, world of uh, operations, but uh, people mistake Docker's from for containers. Containers are standards, standardized now by OCI, and uh, Docker is just a just a command line tool uh, to manage the Docker or container. Yeah, like mistake is easy. So manage the containers. So it's the it's a container ecosystem consists of like a CLI, so management uh, uh, interface, uh, command line tool. Uh, an execution engine where the container execute, and al also container registry where uh, the binary packages are stored and you can you can pull them from. And these are separate pieces, so like you can have them implemented by different implementation. So Docker is a command line tool that does all of that. So building, running, and sharing containers, it can you can do everything with Docker uh, command line. Uh, Docker engine. Is, a, is an engine to run the containers. So it's also like when you install Docker, you install both the CLI and the engine at the same time. Uh, but there are many alternatives. And some of them are like RKT, R R Rocket, ContainerD, RunC, Podman, LXC. So there are many alternatives. And some of them are targeting the same kind of like all, uh, all the ecosystem. And some of them just do one thing. So like ContainerD, for example, is just, just a container execution engine. Uh, or Podman is just there to build uh, the images. Uh, so different parts of the whole ecosystem are, are targeted by different uh, tools, and they are fully interchangeable. That's the nice thing. So like you can have the same Docker images, you can or container images. Yeah, I'm keep on repeating that, like that the the name stays. So you have container images, uh, and you can uh, they are shared. They are they, they they are compatible across all the different tools. Uh, you can have uh, the container image files that you build images from, and they are also compatible. Uh, and you can run the same images on different container engines. So, for example, uh, Kubernetes uh, is using ContainerD uh, and Run C to run the, uh, the containers. It doesn't use Docker. Docker is not a very good uh, Docker engine. Is not a very good execution engine for production for a number of reasons, which I'm not going to go into. Uh, also. Uh, there are different implementations of registries. So Docker Hub is a popular container registry, but there are some alternatives, like uh, GitHub has its own uh, uh, container uh, registry. Uh, Google, Amazon, and, and, and Azure, they all have 
uh, their own registries. And even now in Airflow, we are using the GitHub uh, container registry for all our builds to cache our images. Uh, we, we are just using the Docker Hub to publish officially our images. So what... Uh, Few details about like what is in the container uh, image uh, or container file. So container file is a list of instructions how you build the file system of the container image. So you take the uh, base image that you start from, uh, you run some commands, you copy some files, you set working directory, uh, define entry point, which is the kind of uh, uh, script that you or binary that you run when you enter the container. Uh, and some additional comments. So this is basically a very basic thing about the uh, container file. And uh, with the tools like Docker or Podman, for example, this is another uh, tool for building the, uh, the images. Uh, from the source representation of the file, of the container file, you can build a binary image containing all that that is specified in the file. So this is, this is basically what is a container file. And a few words about the life cycle of container. So container starts with the Docker file um, or container file. Again, uh, it's the name is so much ingrained in, in, in what we do. So it's a container image file. You, you build using some tools and you turn it into a container image. The next thing that happens is like you run, you can run this image on the container execution engine. You just say, okay, take this image and run it. And you can specify additional options, of course. Uh, the next thing that you can do is you can push those container images that you have locally built, you can push them to the registry. Uh, and this might be Docker Hub or GitHub or whatever registry it is. Uh, and what's nice thing is about the registry is that it is a shared registry for, for those images and anybody else, if it's a public image, anybody else can pull the image and use it. So this is a way how you can share whatever you have done. So this is the binary representation of your uh, of your Docker file or container file image file. Uh, you can share it in registry and use it in, a, in the binary form. So um, so so you can have both a source representation in forms of the container file and the binary representation after you build it. So why containers are important? Containers are important because they provide you the very predictable and consistent development in this test environment. So anyone running the same image will get the same results, no matter if uh, it is run on uh, Windows or, or Linux, on Mac OS with the Docker installed, which uses virtual machine under the hood, Linux virtual machine, or Windows, which uses the like Windows uh, subsystem for Linux too. Uh, the Docker con containers executed in all those environments, they will look the same, no matter how, what tools you have installed, no matter uh, what configuration you have of your machine, they will behave the same. And the same, that's for development and test, but it's also for execution. So as I mentioned, like Kubernetes uses containers to run, uh, run application in production, and it uses container D and run C, and uh, it, it provides a super consistent environment that your application can run it, run in. Uh, they are lightweight, but they are isolated. So each container does not interact with each other unless we allow it specifically to interact. And this is also super cool that they can interact between each other. Uh, but generally, they are isolated, uh, and you can treat them uh, separately. And as we know from programming world, uh, isolation is a good property to have because you don't have many coupling, many dependencies, uh, and you don't rely on, on each other too much. And yeah, there is the tagline, build once, run everywhere. We love taglines. Uh, this is exactly what is, is happening. Uh, and again, Kubernetes can run containers nat natively. So Kubernetes is basically nothing more than a very sophisticated uh, container execution engine and management engine. Um, and, and what is really important, I think the, 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 the why containers are important is that they provide this bridge between development and operations. So this is the way how developers developing the application can very easily pass on the applications to uh, to the people who are uh, running it. So uh, there is a, this, this, this short movie which I recorded to show you how important it is to have containers. So I run a, a, one command in, in uh, Breeze, which is the development environment for Airflow. Uh, and this run one, one run command actually starts all those different containers, those like uh, Postgres, Kerberos, uh, um, RabbitMQ, Cassandra, OpenLDAP. So with one command, we can run all of that, 
they are all separated but all connected as well so they interact with each other so this is this is actually super uh, super cool way of um, of um, uh, showing that you know like with with the containers you can have you don't have to have all the configuration for all those different uh, databases and tools you just run them and you expect them to run and they do without any further any any, any previous configuration uh, status what about status so uh, there is a history of containers in Airflow. Uh, I'm, start, I'm starting with CI, and that, that's pretty much the only reference to CI uh, containers uh, that I make, Me, even though that took even more of my time over the last one and a half year. Uh, so uh, they are used in uh, Airflow for more than two years. When I came to the project, they were already there, CI containers, and they were developed by Gerardo Curiel. I'm not sure if I'm reading it right. And a big shout out to Gerardo, Gerardo, I'm not sure. Uh, He's, uh, he created it first and introduced it, uh, and it took him a lot of time from what I discussed. I actually, uh, he's from Melbourne, and he's actually running in, in two days. He's the uh, host of, of the next Apache Airflow Summit uh, session, or not the, the one in two days. Uh, so I'm, I hope to meet and talk to him then. Uh, we spent a few nights together because he is from Melbourne. So once we talked about 3 a.m. in the morning about like some some changes in there and a big shout out to to the work that he has implemented to to, to get it done. And we worked together on improving that. Uh, thank you, Gerardo, for that. Uh, I I took it over and optimized and worked together with Gerardo and optimized and incorporated by Breeze a development environment some more like one and a half year ago or so. And it's been evolving since. Uh, it uses Docker Compose as execution engine. So this is one of the tools that can, is like, a bit, let's say, simple version of Kubernetes. Like, it's not really, but it's like simple version of running several containers and have them talk to each other. Uh, it's been slimmed down recently. So we went down from like two gigs of size to like 130, something like that. That was a huge image. Now it's just a big image. Uh, and thanks, Ash. I mean, he was relentlessly pushing me to like make the image small, make the image small. Make... He did so, so, some parts of it and that pushed me into the right direction and we, we slimmed it down like really a lot. Uh, and it optimized for development use, which means that it rebuilds fast when only source file change. And that's, that's one of the properties that I'm not going to talk too much about. That's a topic for a separate talk, I think. Uh, for production, uh, a lot of people were using Pukel image created by Mathieu Pukel Rossi. And again, thanks to Mathieu, for many years, that was the, the way how to run Airflow in production. And we are moving away from that. Like it's not too maintained uh, anymore. Like 1.10.9 is the last official version by Pukel image. Um, it was used by many users in production. It was used by the publicly available Helm chart. Uh, which was not managed by the community. It was the Helm chart, which was managed by, by a few people who are not very active in the community uh, of Airflow and the development community. And again, thanks to them for, for that. And we are also moving away from that to the community managed one very soon. Uh, so right now we have the official production image managed by community uh, in 1.10.10. We released, uh, Alex, I named it alpha quality, which means that it's never been tested uh, and never got any feedback from anyone. Uh, and beta quality right now released literally a few days ago. Uh, it, it's uh, I pushed it over the weekend. Uh, so now we can use it uh, from officially released uh, binary image in Docker Hub for 1.10.11. It's there. And it's gone through a number of uh, feedback sessions with people and people started using it and it's much improved comparing to the 1.10.10. There are still some bugs. I actually fixed two of them yesterday and pushed them to master. So they are not yet released. They will be released in 1.10.12. They are not big. So there are still some problems, small small things to fix, but not many. And yeah, it's, it's usable. It's already usable for production. So start using it and give feedback because we love to get feedback and love to hear what you want to improve there. Uh, the most important feedback has already been incorporated. Some of that still to be incorporated. Uh, it's already used in production by several people. Uh, the public home chart, uh, the one not managed by community, it's already switched, has already switched to use this image a uh, few weeks ago. Uh, and also the community helm chart that is donated by Astronomer and 
again, thanks to the guys from Astronomer. They are doing a fantastic job there, uh, uh, especially Daniel Ingberman. Uh, he's, he's, he's pushing that. And Greg, Greg from, from Astronomer, who actually donated it and, and made sure it happens. Uh, it uses it for testing, and I'll tell about testing, how, how we are approaching it. Um, so the Helm chart is there in the master. It's not yet released officially. We are working on that to release it soon, but I'm not going to talk about that too much. Uh, so stable version is in V110 stable branch of Airflow, and development version is in master. What is nice, and I'm, I'm talking about a bit later, both can be used to build any version, uh, uh, like 1.10 version of Airflow. So you can use uh, both uh, master and, and stable 1.10 version to build 1.10 image. With master, you might have new features which are developed in master, but it will use the same airflow released from PyPy if you build it properly. So if you're adventurous, uh, use, choose master, but if you want stability, use the stable uh, branch to build uh, image. I will talk about that a little bit later. So few words about the internals. So this is the uh, uh, screenshots from Docker Hub, and I'll, I'll tell a little bit about uh, about all these small uh, components there. So this image size is about 200 uh, megabytes compressed. Uh, compressed, this means that this is the amount of data that you download when you pull the image, uh, because when you pull the image, it, has been, uh, it, it is extracted and uncompressed locally. So it, it takes about like four times more when you uncompress the data, so it's like, Around 800 megabytes when it's uh, decompressed and sitting in your in your disk. But I think the compressed side is more important because because this is the actually the, the transfer that you need to do in order to get the image working. So it's 200 megabytes. Uh, it works in 1.10. We have support for all those versions: 27, 35, 36, 37, 38 is not yet supported in 1.10. We had a question about that yesterday at the at Slack. Uh, 3.8 is not officially supported by Airflow 1.10, so it's not there. Uh, we have 1.10.11 uh, uh, tag. So like, as you see, this is, these are the tags for Python 3, 5, 3, 2, 7, 3, 5, 3, 7, 3, 6. Uh, we have 1.10.11, which doesn't have Python, and it's Python 3.6. And uh, yeah, we have a discussion about that on that list, whether it should be 3.6 or something else. Uh, I'm not sure what's going to happen in the future. For now, it's 3.6. It's manually released. I released it manually. Uh, uses 1.10.1 tag from the Git from the git uh, so we can you can actually reproduce it by checking out these tags and you can rebuild the same image from 1.10.11 that's what i did when i produced the image and we also have one uh, additional tag which is added on the after the feedback so we have latest this means that if you just do docker pull apache airflow without latest without specifying specifying version this is the version that you will pull so we will pull 1.10.1 Python 3.6, when you just pull Apache Airflow. So now the question is like, what should we release as a community? Uh, that was a question that I asked myself. Uh, should we release the, uh, the image file or we should, should we release the image in the Docker Hub? Uh, because the, Im the image file is a source and the image file in, is, in the, uh, is, is a binary version. Uh, binary representation. So uh, uh, by default, Apache Source Software Foundation releases sources and not binaries. This is the, the rule. Uh, so everything we do, uh, even if we release some binaries for convenience of the users, uh, everything should be rebuildable from released sources. This is the like absolute mask. Like the, there is no, no way around. So whenever we release something officially, there should be a way to build it from released sources. Uh, some, if we release a final version, like a 1.10.11 binary, we have to have a way to rebuild it from sources. And th that, that's what happened with PyPy packages, for example. So we have the sources from which we re rebuild those packages, and we can always repeat that and, and redo that. And this is super important property of whatever Apache Airflow, uh, Apache Software Foundation releases, uh, product release. Uh, so, the idea is that users should be able to rebuild the software they need. This is the, the kind of basic assumption from for releases. Uh, and so the question like, should we contain, should we release the image, the binary image, because it's convenient to use. You can docker pool and you can use it. Or should we release container file that the people can use to rebuild the software or both? Uh, 
So my answer is both. And there are different uses, usages for those. And I'll tell uh, a little bit more about that when uh, when we go to, uh, to usage. But I'm happy to discuss all the things afterwards in the Slack or in the dev list. Uh, this is my this, this is my view on that, and like I'm, I'm, I'm I hope this presentation will also uh, like start some discussions around that. So, what are the features of the production image we have? So it's around 230 max the, in master, 210 as you saw in 1.10. It's a little bit bigger in master, around 800 megabyte and disk when uncompressed. Uh, Python 2735367, and that there is a mistake there. Uh, production image in master supports 35363738. So this is uh, 272637 is this 1.10 version. Uh, by default, it installs some extras. So as you know, Airflow has a number of optional integrations or optional extras that you can choose. So we chose the chose the kind of representative uh, set of uh, of extras that are pre-installed, but. Uh, you can also, in the few, I'll show you in a moment, install your own extras if you want. Uh, this is the kind of like the binary image that we release contains those extras. That's it. Uh, and this might change in the future, uh, but for now, this is the set of extras that we're using. It's also, and that's that was a feedback, which I think, I think I can't remember exactly who was it, but we had some feedback that it should be made OpenShift compatible. And uh, I, I read about that and yeah, we made it compatible, which means that it can be run with any user. So like OpenShift, when it runs container, it doesn't use the default Airflow user. It can it generates a random user ID and uses it for running. And right now, uh, Airflow image supports that. So you can you can use Airflow image in OpenShift. It's, it, we, OpenShift is a Red Hat, or now IBM after both Red Hat, uh, uh, Kubernetes-based uh, uh, platform to run uh, containers. Uh, it also has some optimization of parallelism for Junicorn, Junicorn uh, using shared memory, which is uh, a nice property to have because you can have more parallel uh, website threads. Uh, uh, the feature of the image file, and that's that's an important one. So, like again, we have the image a container image, and we have container image file. Both of them we release, like one in sources, one in, uh, as binary. Um, it builds the optimized image, uh, so. Whenever you run build on this Docker file, the image get is optimized uh, for size. This is the important part, the the, the, the important the most important criteria. It's also highly customizable. So when I started working on the development on the production image, there were some other images available, and I started from the scratch and made it uh, really customizable. So every bit and piece is customizable. Uh, you can change it by our arguments, build arguments, and I started to incorporate so certain features. Uh, from different places, uh, and it's like it's not, it's now really really nicely customizable. You can do a lot of stuff with it. It's also multi-segmented. I'll tell a bit more about that. So that's a relatively new, like maybe two years uh, feature in Docker uh, file and in containers that you can have one image file containing several images and relation between them, and that's what we have, and that's what we used for uh, optimization. And I'll tell about a bit about that now. So the first image in the image file that we have is the uh, build image. So the build image is the is where we install Airflow. And it's it's big. Uh, it's 600 megabytes compressed. So it's like it's far bigger than the, 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 the final image, like three times bigger, because it contains uh, more stuff than the final image. Uh, it contains so like the kind of like internals of the image. So we have we have some arguments. As you can see, we see the version. We see the which extras are installed uh, from where. Then then we see like uh, from where we build the image. So like Python base image, which is another argument. Uh, we see the installing up dependencies and what's what's there. We also built, and this is the important bits, a bit and piece. Like we built, we also add all the um, built development dependencies which are needed to actually install Airflow uh, and build uh, some uh, pip packages. So when you install some pip packages, you sometimes need to compile it with a compiler. And this is what build essentially is about. Like this, these are all the compilers that are needed to build some extensions, and some of the libraries they require development version to be installed as well. So this is what is in the build image, and that's what uh, what actually gives the image that size because we have all the compilers and all the development libraries in. Uh, then we are installing Airflow, and that's that's really interesting. I'm using the user flag 
And this is really super cool. User flag, this is not very known uh, flag of pip. It, all, it installs everything to home.local. Uh, and I mean everything. So basically, you can take the local dot local folder, put it into another machine of the same type, like the same processor, etc., and the same libraries, the same kernel version, ideally, or the same the same libraries, the same version of software OS, and it will. Uh, and then you kind of transplant the installation of pip packages. Uh, they are all by so not only Python is there, but all the shared libraries used, etc., cetera, etc. Cetera. That's not a very well known feature, but it's it's actually super useful in our case. I'll tell more why. Uh, then we are including constraints. I will not go about constraints. No time for that. But we have some very weird way of 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 running constraints and uh, using constraint using uh, constraining the pip installation in airflow uh, you can read all about that in the in the documentation and then what is what what's also interesting uh, we are doing this uh, uh, this uh, inst uh, yarn transpiling so we are converting our uh, JavaScript, plain JavaScript into highly optimized JavaScript, including all the libraries and only those libraries, super small with Yarn. And that's actually uh, another big gain. So like the, the image is so big, big because of those libraries and because of those, uh, the, the Yarn package in there and side comment, we delete those packages. So they are not uh, remaining even in, in the 600 megabytes, but just, you know, like just our simple website, we, we, Simple, simple uh, web server uh, is like 730 models and 360 megabytes of node modules downloaded. So it's like J JavaScript. JavaScript ecosystem is terrible. Uh, I must say, uh, it's like you know, uh, and it's about 700 megabytes compressed to gigabytes on disk. This is the size, and it only uses root user. It doesn't have our flow user in there uh, for simplicity. Now there is the second part of the image, so this second segment, and that's that's how optimization is implemented. So the second segment actually uses the Airflow installed in the first one and only install what is needed for to run it. So only in runtime. So again, passing some runtime variables in here, installing app dependencies, but this time we don't install build essential. We don't install all the dev dependencies, which makes it much more smaller. We're adding Airflow user, which is the default user it runs on, uh, on, on uh, with a root group, sorry for the uh, spell, spelling problem. So we are uh, using the root group here and changing everything to be owned by the root group in order to allow the OpenShift uh, compatibility. And uh, yeah, we are copying some scripts. Uh, but what what we really uh, do, it, this is important part here. We are copying the root.local Airflow installation into the home deer.local, which means that we are transplanting all the installed Airflow from build image to the uh, to the Airflow image, and we only take Airflow, nothing else. And that's that's where what makes the optimization works. Optionally, we can copy DAGs. This is mostly used for testing, uh, for copying DAGs that for production, you should use something entirely different. Uh, copying entry point and clean logs, um, some scripts that we are using for running. Uh, changing access to the to the password for the, um, for the OpenShift to work. We are embedding some DAGs for tests. I mentioned that. And optimizing Unicore for, for parallelism, setting working directory, exposing port number. Uh, setting the right user and also uh, dumping it is used for handling signals properly for entry point wherever you enter the image. But these are the internals: 230 megabytes compressed, 800 megabytes on disk. Uh, the entry point we have uh, it uses some like creates dynamically the user for OpenShift. This is the script that is run when you enter. Uh, it detects uh, or sets the right database. Then it waits until, and this is important thing. So we do verify connections. So we wait until the database is up when we set it. So this like the image will wait. The, the airflow will not start before the database is ready. Uh, we also wait for the DB broker uh, if we configure it. And we also, by default, when you run airflow, and that's important, you run airflow image, production image, uh, you run Airflow command. Uh, so if you run the image and you specify like db create, it will create a db. If you if you run other command Airflow, you will 
run the Airflow command. But there are two exceptions. You can run bash or Python as a first parameter, and then it will run bash or Python command and execute this command. So this is this is like how the entry point looks like. A few words about Docker Ignore. I will not go in detail. I don't have too much time for that. But uh, something watch out when you will play. We'll be playing with uh, with our container image file and container image. By default, we are ignoring everything and only adding what is needed. And this is really important because uh, because the Airflow when builds when when you build it locally, it actually builds a lot of stuff internally and produces a lot of uh, artifacts in the source code. So this way, by ignoring everything and only adding what we needed, we avoid accidentally adding anything that was generated in the sources. So how we test the image for the internals? So both image and chart are part of Apache Airflow monorepo. So we have one repo with all of that, uh, Airflow uh, image and chart. Uh, we build the image every time we do PR. So like our CI build builds the image and we use it in the Kubernetes test for master. So uh, we run some tests. We install the Helm chart. We install the Airflow with the Helm chart and with the production image. And it, we, run, we run tests against it. Uh, and uh, we also are planning to, uh, to to test the Helm chart against the released images. This is still a work in progress. I have PR open, which fails right now. I have to fix it. And we will also add more tests. So. Usage, how to use the image. So this is this is the the, geese, the, the final part of the presentation, really, what I want to show how you can extend the image. So first uh, way how you can extend the image, if and this is the traditional way you do with other images, you just take the image from the cloud, you pull it, you run your own Docker file when you, uh, when you change the user. In our case, you have to change back to root user because we are using root user. You can install your own dependencies, like Emacs, for example, here. Uh, uh, change back to the user, you install any pip packages you want, uh, then you can add your DAGs, for example, and by copying them, and then you build your own uh, Airflow image, and you can use this, this Airflow image with your own modifications, because Airflow basic Airflow image is like simple, it contains only the basic stuff, you can add something this way. So this is, this is one of the ways that you can do that. Um, okay, those, those are the things. Uh, and there are some pros and cons of using this in this way, because you're using the released binary images as a source. Uh, the, the another is uh, like you, another pro is that you are using simple build command. You just have your own Docker file that you build. You have your own Docker file that you manage. You don't need Airflow sources. You just need the binary. This is the kind of very convenient way. Uh, the cons is that you don't use all the optimization capabilities that I added in production image because you are adding stuff afterwards, after the build image is already gone. So we have this build and uh, main image. Build image is gone while you, when you are building it, so you don't have all these optimizations. And if you want to compile something, you will have to add, will build essentials, essentials and build it, and it will increase the size of the image. Uh, you, can, you only have predefined extracts, and there is no easy way to install new ones. Uh, and you only have limited sort of set of Python dependencies installed. Um, However, there is a better way or another way, let's say, so to speak, you can customize, customize the Airflow image uh, yourself. So you can build it yourself. And this is the kind of recommended one for most of the usages, I think. So first you need to clone the image. You need to check out the right version, which is like stable if you are uh, conservative and master if you are adventurous. Then you run Docker build. If you run Docker build dot, it will just install the same what is installed in, in Airflow 1.10.1. So default Python 3.6, default extras, no additional dependencies. However, and that's where things become most interesting, uh, you can also add various arguments to uh, customize it. So you can change additional, uh, you can add additional extras, you can add additional dependencies, development and runtime dependencies, development dependencies when they require to be built and runtime when they just need to be installed in the final image. So it doesn't, it doesn't use, it doesn't have to use local sources. You can also specify that it should install uh, 1.10.11 version of Airflow from PyPy, for example, or from GitHub even, if you want from a specific tag in GitHub. So it's like super customizable. And I will not go into lots of details here, but you can like choose base image, install Airflow from PyPy, install GitHub branch or tag, install additional extras or Python devs, development devs, runtime devs, uh, 
You can choose different UID group ID. You can choose different home, different home directory, Airflow home. You can even build Cassandra driver concurrently. Cassandra driver takes 10 minutes to build. So you really, if you have a big machine, it's better you build it uh, concurrently. Uh, so all these parameters are documented nicely in images RST, and you can read all the details there. So, but that's not all because the, the build the command was fairly complex, but you can do it in a very, very simple way as well because we have Breeze. So Breeze is a development and test environment that I developed for Airflow, uh, but it also supports building production image very easily. So we can, you can specify the production image flag, additional e extras uh, or Python version or Python depth. So most of the parameters that you can specify with the uh, variables of build arcs, you can specify here with command line parameters which have autocomplete options. So you can very easily like run the command and test how it works because Breeze has autocomplete. Uh, we have new Breeze video, which is showing the uh, how to build the, those production images. And you have help, so you can actually see the web built image uh, commands you can use. And it's all described in Breeze RST in, in the Airflow rep. So there are some pros and cons for, uh, for optimizing, uh, for using it this way. It's highly optimized. So the, the same optimization that are applied for the standard image will be applied for your own customized version. You can build image from sources, which is good for security reviews because your security team, if you're in a corporate environment, will actually know where it came from. It's not a random binary. It's just some sources that you use, and it only uses officially released uh, images and, and dependencies uh, from, from PyPy or from Apt. Uh, it can add any extras, adds any dependencies, you can have Breeze build commands to run it. And again, you can run it from both master and 1.10 branch, depending how adventurous you are. Uh, the con cons for that is like, you need to have access to Airflow sources. It's not enough to have just image. You have to have the whole image, whole sources of Airflow checked out because it uses a number of, small number of dependencies from the sources. Uh, the, the, the build command is fairly complex and you need to understand internals uh, to, uh, to run it. But why not eat a half cake at the same time? So uh, you can actually do combine those two uh, approaches. So uh, one team, for example, in your company can build, can build you the base image using the sources and customize it. And then you can use your own Docker image. So this is like, the, again, the same process. So getting sources, using Breeze to build the image, and you have your own customized version of the image for your own company. And now, you can take this image as a base and build your own Docker file and uh, and add any customization on top of that. So you have this intermediate step where is the image is specific for your company or department, and then you can add your DAGs, for example. So this is a perfect way if you have um, changing DAGs and you don't want to rebuild the whole image, you just have the one base image, and whenever DAGs change, you can run your own Docker file and add the DAG DAG files to this uh, to this image, and that's 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 a fantastic way to uh, to, sp to faster develop and faster iterate with, with, with your images. Uh, okay, so a few words about uh, deploying. So we have Docker and Docker Compose, uh, which is not recommended for production. This is like an engine to run them. We have managed container services like uh, Amazon ECS, Google Container uh, on VMs, Azure Container Instances, but then you have to manage the containers on your own. You have Kubernetes on-premises as well, uh, which you can use Helm chart. In the very future, we will release it, and you, you will be able to use this Helm chart to deploy it on your own Kubernetes uh, on-premises. We have Airflow Operator. We are not recommending this one yet because it's going to be rewritten re re with the new Helm chart. It will be regenerated uh, as a new Airflow Operator. It is Kubernetes Operator. It's not... I don't know. Airflow operator, it's, it's yeah. Uh, and you also have managed Kubernetes like Amazon AKS or Google GK, uh, Google Kubernetes engine or Azure AKS, uh, and you can run uh, it there. Uh, you can also use OpenShift. As I mentioned, uh, our Airflow image is OpenShift compatible. Okay, last slide, um, just almost Bernie made it. So what's the future of Airflow images? Uh, it won't change too much. It's pretty much like fixed or like, like most of the things are there, uh, we will not. I do not expect many changes. So we will do more automated testing with Helm chart. We will do some automated releases for 2.0. Right now it's manual, but we will automate it. Uh, actually, one of the big changes that might come it's like ARM support because I don't know if you've followed that, but Apple just announced a few days ago that 
they are switching their Mac OS into supporting ARM and the new Macs will also, like there will be Intel still, but there will be ARM-based uh, Macs. So for developers who are using Macs, we probably want to have ARM support in. Uh, and a uh, fun story, my friend already built Airflow for ARM and some people did. Uh, I, I, I read some, some stories that people managed that because they wanted to run it on, on Raspberry Pis and my friend did that, so it's possible. Uh, we have official, we will have official Docker Compose, most likely. That's an, one of the next steps that we need to add so that if people want to use Docker Compose uh, nicely, by community managed Docker, Docker Compose, they will be able to do so. And some smaller features like on build support, there, there is a kind of controversial feature of Docker or in container files, uh, which I'm not sure if it's, we are going to use. There is an open issue about uh, using CMD support for dynamically generated uh, variables. Uh, automated user creation is another thing, which I'm not sure if we are going to implement. This is a, an open issue on, on our GitHub issues, and we'll see if we will implement it. Uh, that's about it. Uh, thank you. I'm not sure if we have many time for questions, uh, um, but uh, but I'm open, open to, to have any questions. And even if we don't have any questions right now, I know that the time is not perfect, maybe. Like, I wanted this to happen in the time zone Asia friendly and in the Tokyo meetup, which uh, I think is like a great initiative. Uh, uh, but some people are sleeping in US. Uh, uh, Pedro, for example, is like midnight for, for Pedro right now. Uh, so um, I'm sure some more questions will come and I invite everyone to uh, comment and uh, ask questions on the dev list or in the prod Docker image um, Slack channel that we have dedicated for that. Um, so even if now there are no questions, then uh, then, then I'm happy to take them uh, later. We, the feedback, hi, Jarek. The feedback that we're getting is that it is such an immersive session that I cannot have time to think and ask. So. Yeah, yeah. <laughs> I can imagine. I, you know, like it's it's a bit like you know, I try to squeeze. Uh, a year and a half of my experiences working with the Docker image uh, of Airflow in in these forty five minutes, and that's 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 really difficult. I actually took uh, just a comment. I just took the as a as a base. I I, I mentioned this presentation from from Michael Hewitt uh, about the Kubernetes uh, uh, Airflow and Kubernetes. I, I was amazed how much uh, Michael managed to put into this presentation. How many concepts? Yeah, it was a lot. And a lot, a lot. And, and it's going to be recorded. So, you know, like you can, uh, in, in YouTube, you can put it on like slow-mo uh, and get it, get it like, you know, like uh, one hour, 45 minutes instead of 45 minutes uh, and watch it later. Uh, but but it was, for me, it was really important. Like, to, to be honest, like, you know, like the, there, the, there is there is one one small thing I wanted to mention. You know, like I'm, I'm leading the content uh, for Airflow Summit. Uh, and I, it's not that I had any advantage of, of getting in and talking today. Uh, I actually submitted three, uh, talks, which I wanted to talk about. Not only that, a few other things and only one was accepted by the, the, the committee. So I didn't have an advantage. So I had to put in a lot of things. Uh. Okay. We have one question by Brandon Plines. Uh, how dramatic are the performance gains when using um, a different image for each Airflow service, whether it's web server, scheduler, or worker? So by default, for all of them, you should use the same image. I mean, I mean, there is no big like uh, all server schedule and worker, they require pretty much the same prerequisite and the same amount of airflow. There's a lot of dependencies between them. So it's much better to have just one image and run all of them with this one image, uh, because then the image is downloaded and installed only once. And it's, it's also like the, the, the way if they both run on the same machine, the, 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 there are certain optimization in the container engines that uh, a lot of those libraries and dependencies uh, will be just loaded once, the, the OS level, uh, the kernel stuff, yeah? Not the image itself, uh, not the dependencies inside the image, but at least uh, you don't lose time for pulling the new image and, uh, you know, loading that and decompressing, and it is it takes a little, uh, the same space, uh, disk space. 
So, um, uh, so my recommendation as, as, as will be just to run, to have one image and run all of them with the same image. Uh, th th there is no advantage of splitting that. Okay. And uh, Brandon also asks us, what are the main improvements over Pockel's image? Mm, over, I think the simplicity, that's the thing, uh, like, and customizability, this is the main thing. There is, I, I, I looked at the Pockel image, uh, it had a little bit too much for me, uh, like I didn't know which of those features were used, which were not really used and which were not really useful. Some of those features like the user creation, this is something that in my opinion, uh, and that's I'm open for discussion, but it shouldn't be part of the of the of the image itself. Like the image should be as simple as possible. You can run stuff uh, outside of the image, so you can run like init containers with the same image, and you can run certain operations on that. So right now, for example, you can take the production image and run the bash any command or Python any command. And you can run it as an init container in Kubernetes to create the user. And the main containers will not start until this init container is uh, finalized the job. So, and this is the great work to do all the maintenance or like deployment stuff that you need without necessarily complicating the image. But I think uh, simplicity, uh, because at the end, the image is simple. It's just very much customizable. So all the parameters are there, but the image itself is, is rather simple and it doesn't have unnecessary stuff. So that's, that's the main improvement. And, uh, also it's hundred megabytes smaller. So it's like 200 megabytes instant instead of 300 megabytes. And that's something, the compressed size. Uh, so that's, uh, that's an important improvement, I think. Okay. Uh, another question now by Daniel Lamblin. Will there be a pre-release of the community helm with the community container images if we want to kick those tires ASAP? You can so kick... What is the time frame for that release? Okay, you can kick those tires now. Like you can take the helm chart from master and try it. Uh, no, you know, like no guarantees. Uh, <laughs> no, uh, no harm. Uh, we will we'll claim no, like, do, do whatever you want with it, but yeah, it's 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 ready for use. It's tested regularly, so every time we build the PR, the Hound chart and community image and Airflow together are tested. So you can you can test master Airflow, uh, Hound chart and production image together. It's it's like it's it works because because we run the test and we will, we are adding more tests around that. We are adding the feature to test this Helm chart with the released version of Airflow 1.10.11, so the latest one. Uh, so we, we are sure that the Helm chart is actually working with the released version, but feel free to use it right now. You can, you can, there are instructions how to use and install uh, Airflow using Helm chart, uh, in the, in the chart directory of, of Helm, of, of Airflow. So feel free to use it even now. So that's consider that as a pre-release. Uh, we will, we are still discussing the cadence, how often we are going to release Helm chart and how to do that. This is a discussion on the dev list we have. Uh, and, uh, I'm, I'm not sure where it's going to happen. It's more, I think, uh, Daniel Imberman, uh, wants to implement a lot of testing before we release it. And I think that's very reasonable to be able to, uh, you know, to fix any problems. We also have a way to test it easily. So I think the prerequisite for official release of Helm chart will be to actually uh, make all the tests comprehensive because we only test like Kubernetes executor in like one simple configuration. And we have much more, uh, much more configure, many more configuration in the Helm chart right now. 